Hi, my name's Fred Zell. I'm a geologist living in Pittsburgh, and this video is being made in April 2022 about geology of the Upper Ohio Valley area, and especially the area around Wellsburg, West Virginia, in preparation for a, an outdoors geology event that we're having in Wellsburg on Sunday, April 24th in the afternoon. So let me, let me uh, share my screen here and, and uh, get us going. Share screen. And maximize. There we go. Okay, uh, the picture here shows um, 17th Street Park where we'll meet uh, for the excursion on April 24th. This was in uh, 2020 during the, uh, a part of the pandemic where people were still distancing. And uh, it's a group of naturalists studying the outcrop across the Ohio River. And a big feature of the field excursion will be uh, to be able to see that outcrop uh, that people in Wellsburg see every day across the river, see it through the eyes of a geologist. And this talk is meant to provide lots of regional background, more, than, more background than I would be able to provide in person on the day, and with a lot more displays than I would be able to show um, using paper copies and a flip chart. Um, so there you can see I'm, I'm using a, a map. We'll uh, do a general orientation, but it won't be nearly as detailed as this talk um, on the 24th. I encourage you to bring rocks or fossils if you'd like me to take a look and try to identify them. Um, we're going to meet in the grassy area where you can see the river uh, beyond the end of 18th Street and in between the uh, ball fields. It'll be helpful to bring a folding chair um, it'd be great to bring binoculars to be able to see the outcrop across the way. Paper and some sort of paper, a notebook, but some, some sort of paper that you can use to make a sketch of the outcrop because that'll help you uh, make observations um, more carefully uh, that we can talk about. A little bit of background about me. I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania. After uh, college and grad school, I worked for ExxonMobil for 30 years, retired in 2015. Uh, I'm married to another person from Bethel Park, south of Pittsburgh, four kids and four grandkids. We've lived several different places. I've done uh, my share of outcrop study of uh, rocks, geology field work, came back to Pittsburgh after retiring. We live on Mount Washington. Um, since retiring, I've, I've become a bit of a cyclist. I'm certified as a cycling instructor. I like to uh, ride and volunteer with charity bike rides, including some cross-country ones, as you'll see. I also like to go visit uh, high school science classes or groups of adults to talk about energy, climate, Pennsylvania geology. Climate is probably the most popular topic I speak about these days. Um, I started an LLC, Earth Science Excursions, about a year ago um, and uh, started doing a lot of volunteer work, leading cycling and hiking trips with geology themes for adults. And I also created a STEM and cycling curriculum for kids, which I uh, started teaching last year and will continue. And I'll be happy to talk with people about any of those uh, during the excursion on the 24th. Um, I show this because when I give geology talks, if I show a slide like this, sometimes this is the thing people are most interested in. Uh, but these are, this shows cross country and longer rides that I've done, uh, the longer of the rides. Uh, the black line near the top, the northern tier from Maine to Seattle, that was a ride with Bike the US for MS group in 2017. I helped lead a Bike the US for MS group from Virginia to San Francisco, shown in gray in 2018. I did part of the Northern Tier again in 2019, uh, Maine to Cleveland. Um, I've cycled the uh, Great Allegheny Passage and CNO uh, Canal towpath from Pittsburgh to DC. Um, also did a solo self-supported 500 mile ride from Pittsburgh uh, to the end of the Shenandoah Valley here and then down the Shenandoah Valley to Blacksburg uh, a few years ago. Um, another couple day trip along the Atlantic coast here. And I've done weekend bike MS trips, the Houston to Austin one several years ago. And I've done the uh, one that goes from north of Pittsburgh up to Lake Erie. 
And those have been great. And I'll be glad to talk about any of that uh, during the field excursion. This is one of the places I've done geology field work in Southern Utah. Geologists love places that are uh, desert areas because we can see the rocks. There's not so much soil and vegetation to cover them. And here in, in Southern Utah and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, this gray rock unit is a sedimentary rock unit. It was a uh, uh, shale that was uh, deposited in an interior seaway 93 million years ago here. Um, it's mostly clay-sized particles compressed into rock, um, and it's not very resistant to erosion. It tends to form slopes. The cliffs here are held up by tan uh, colored sandstones with lots of quartz grains in them, which are very resistant to erosion. And that difference in uh, resistance to erosion is uh, why there's a relationship between underlying geology, hills and valleys or the landforms. And that'll be a theme of uh, part of the talk. Our uh, objectives for the 24th and for this talk are to stay safe, for the participants on the 24th to be able to identify the most common types of rocks found around Wellsburg um, that uh, largely through this uh, talk that you can understand uh, the geologic origin of the, of the upper Ohio Valley area landforms. And on the 24th, we'll be able to look across the water at the outcrop and uh, talk about um, how it was, how the rock layers were formed and deposited and what it all means. So this presentation then, uh, there's a brief introduction to rock types. Then we'll talk briefly about paleoclimate. And again, I have a whole climate talk I'm happy to give to groups of people. Um, then we'll focus on Upper Ohio Valley, big picture geology and the relationship between geology and the landscapes or the shapes of the land. And then some of the details of the Upper Ohio Valley and the relationship between um, the uh, rivers uh, today and the river valleys and uh, the glaciations that came and went and how those helped shape the landscapes even away from the places where the glaciers were. Then uh, there's some slides that introduce the uh, excursion on uh, April 24th. So on to our Geology 101 introduction to rock types. Three main types of rocks. Sedimentary are deposited from particles, sand, clay, silt. Um, it could be uh, deposited by a river at the bottom of a river in a delta. It could be in a, a lake or an ocean basin. It could be a flood uh, material that's deposited on land. Um, or uh, it could be windblown uh, dunes. Metamorphic rocks are formed when uh, rock, rocks are uh, buried so deeply, they're subjected to so much heat and pressure that they actually start to recrystallize. So those turn into metamorphic rocks. And then igneous rocks have cooled from liquid magma uh, deep underground or lava at the surface. So they're cooled from molten rock. And the kinds of sedimentary rocks that we'll talk about and that are uh, found in bedrock in our area are sedimentary rocks. There are metamorphic and igneous rocks that were carried down from Canada by glaciers and washed into the river systems, can be found on river, ancient river terraces. We'll talk briefly about some of those, but the bedrock in our area is sedimentary. So a couple of years ago, I went around and collected lots of uh, examples of different kinds of rocks in our area and put them into rock kits. So we'll have a chance on the 24th to uh, sort out rocks and, and identify these basic rock types. Al along with on the right are three common building materials that you find on the surface too. And it's good to be able to identify those as well. So that'll be an, an in-person exercise that we do. To help uh, understand the relation between that and the outcrop that we'll see, it's helpful to look at a map and then a vertical section on the next slide. And this map is, is meant to indicate general uh, geography of the region. You can see the outline of Pennsylvania here. So Wellsburg is just, just to the left. General geography of this area about 300 million years ago, about the time that the rocks that are at the surface in our area were deposited. And you can see off to the east here, there are high mountains, there was once as high as the Andes now worn down to their roots, but there's a big coastal plain in front of that, and then an inland seaway to the west. 
rivers draining the mountains carried sand, silt, and clay out into the seaway. Floods carried silt and clay into floodplains and deposited what became shales in between the rivers. Um, at times and in places, there were freshwater lakes, and some of those formed uh, freshwater limestones. There's some of those in the outcrop that we'll see. In quiet areas or at quiet times, there could be peat swamps uh, formed. When those were buried, they turned into coal deposits. We'll see some of those. The rivers carrying sand down to the seaway could deposit sand in deltas. There could be silts and clays deposited far offshore. Um, if the seaway floods in, um, and uh, not as much clay and silt is coming into the seaway at, at that time. There can be marine limestones, thin marine limestones deposited that actually have fossils of things that lived in seawater. And we'll see some of those in our rock kits, and we'll see uh, at least one of those pretty well across the way in the outcrop. So this is a lateral, uh, lateral relationships between those different depositional environments. I hope you can imagine that if the sea floods in, for example, if a delta is abandoned, the land subsides and the sea floods in, or if global sea level rises, um, then you can get a marine limestone deposit on top of these other deposits. And then if a delta builds out over it, um, you can have offshore shales give way to shoreline sandstones and then um, marine or uh, river, river channel sandstones or overbank deposits in between. At times, there could be uh, coals from peat deposits. So I hope you can imagine a vertical succession of rocks, not just a lateral succession. And this is meant to help illustrate this uh, vertical succession idea. Um, this is like looking at a vertical column of rocks. Here's a weathering profile. The stippled, stippled pattern indicates sandstone. When it has lots of quartz in it, it's especially resistant to erosion, stands out, forms cliffs. Here's a thin, limestone. It also uh, stands out in relief compared with shales with lots of clay that are slope forming. And this vertical succession is meant to indicate a flooding of the seaway in, a marine limestone deposited, maybe some marine shale on top of that as a delta build out, and then delta front uh, sandstones, maybe river sandstones in this position too with an erosional surface at the bottom. Uh, you could have a uh, coastal plain, shales on top. Um, there could be uh, non-marine limestones deposited too. There's a, uh, an underclay that's a, an ancient soil that was developed below a peat swamp on the coastal plain that uh, when it was buried turned into coal. And then the whole thing can repeat over with another marine flooding. So this is an ideal vertical sequence that might be tens of feet thick in outcrops in our area you don't always get the whole vertical succession, but we will see some examples of this uh, when we look at rocks. So that was our just quick little geology 101 intro to rock types uh, that we'll talk about during the excursion. Now we're gonna look at some bigger picture things uh, and then zoom in on the upper Ohio Valley. So uh, Eastern North America, uh, you can see the area where we'll be meeting here in the West Virginia Panhandle. This is uh, an elevation map. The red elevations are higher elevations, the greens are low. We'll see a whole series of maps uh, that are similar to this. And you can see the Appalachian Mountains through here, uh, the Alleghenies there, and uh, down here are the Smokies on trend with the Blue Ridge. And the main reason I want you to see this big picture perspective is so that you get an idea of uh, the big long regional trends uh, in these different uh, landscape elements that are formed by different types of rock. Here in the Smoky Mountains, the main rock type is metamorphic, so crystalline rocks. There are some igneous rocks that are crystalline too. When you look at it closely, there's really not a preferred orientation of drainage, a preferred orientation of ridges and valleys there. They kind of go every which way. Very different than the central Appalachians here in West Virginia and, and central Pennsylvania. Um, and you'll see that uh, these long ridges and valleys are formed by long sedimentary rock layers that are turned up on their edge. Look at the Adirondacks, uh, very similar to the Smokies, um, not a strong preferred orientation of the uh, 
um, valleys and uh, mountains there. Again, mostly crystalline rocks, metamorphic rocks with some igneous rocks. This is a plateau in front of uh, what was the root of this ancient mountain belt. You'll see that, that these long ridges and valleys were formed by compression and that compression formed folds in front of them. You can see these broad folds in front here. And these shapes have everything to do with the geology because um, these rock layers uh, once were in the subsurface. Here in the West Virginia Panhandle, the uh, rocks at the surface today typically were buried uh, 8,000 feet, maybe as much as 10,000 feet deep. Um, here in farther to the east, these rock layers may once have been buried as much as 30,000 feet or even more and are mostly uh, recrystallized metamorphic rocks and, and igneous rocks that formed at depth and cooled slowly enough for large crystals to form. So the rocks at the surface through here, uh, for the most part, uh, were uh, very deeply buried in the past, except glacial deposits we'll talk about that are only a few million years old. But the rocks at the surface here that are 300 million years old or so were once buried much more deeply. So we really are looking at the subsurface uh, when we look at the uh, surface geology today. And we'll, uh, we'll zero in on, uh, on this area and talk about some of the details, but this map should give you an idea that the details we see in this area uh, cover pretty large areas um, on the edge of North America here. Okay, here's a little more detailed map then, a little bit closer view. And um, you can see, again, the root of this ancient mountain belt that 300 million years ago was as high as the Andes, worn down to its roots now with these long ridges and valleys in the Appalachians in between. The valleys are underlain by uh, shales uh, full of clay that's easy to erode and limestones that in our area where there's so much rainfall, uh, they dissolve in rainwater. So the limestones and shales tend to form valleys and these ridges are held up by rock layers that are more resistant to erosion now turned on their edge um, and those are quartz rich sandstones. Same thing with these long upward folds and the downward fold in between. This is Chestnut Ridge, that's Laurel Hill with the Ligonier Valley uh, low fold in between. And those long ridges are held up by quartz rich sandstones armoring the sides. Here where we are, we're in a plateau uh, where the rock layers are relatively flat lying there's not a strong preferred orientation of uh, the rivers and streams and the valleys and ridges like there is here in central Pennsylvania and farther east in West Virginia. So the rivers kind of go every which way. And we'll talk in some detail about the uh, reason why rivers are oriented uh, uh, the way they are today. But it's a more random uh, pattern of drainage because of the relatively flat lying rock layers. And then, of course, we get to the coastal plain here uh, um, in New Jersey, where it's very flat. Um, there are relatively young sediments uh, going off uh, to the coastline, just like there are within a few miles of Lake Erie. There's a lake plain up there, too. But in between the coastal plain and lake plain, most of the elevation of the land, the shape of the land, is formed by erosion of these different rock layers. Uh, modified by glaciers and smoothed by glaciers uh, to the north here, uh, north of where uh, the southern edge of the glaciers came. Now let's look at a geologic cross-section uh, from DD prime. It goes through the um, uh, West Virginia panhandle and then down into the more central part of West Virginia, northern West Virginia. And a little bit closer view of the area here, you can see it gets into this valley and ridge uh, geographic province. It covers the high plateau here, uh, some higher elevations with those broad folds. And then it goes into the low plateau here with, I mentioned that the rock layers are relatively flat lying. Um, this is what the rock layers look like on a geologic map of West Virginia and adjacent states. Each color here is a different age of rock layer from the younger uh, rock layer, sedimentary rock layer in this uh, medium blue going to older rock layers in these other colors. Um, and then across uh, here, 
there are much older rock layers at the surface than are at the surface in the plateau. So the Valley and Ridge has a lot of older rock layers exposed at the, at the surface than are in the high plateau or in the low plateau. So here's the cross section I mentioned. Um, you can see the scale here. This is 2000 feet vertically for scale. Uh, the horizontal line here is sea level in elevation. There's minus 24,000 feet in elevation. This is a few thousand feet high, the highest part here in the high plateau. And these are each different rock layers um, in the subsurface. And uh, these are wells uh, that were drilled that help constrain where those rock layers are in the subsurface. And you can see that in the low, low plateau, the rock layers are fairly flat lying. There are some broad folds, uh, but there are tighter folds in the high plateau. And then once you get into the Valley and Ridge province here, um, these rock layers that are down deep in the plateau were actually thrust up shallower um, and some of them crop out um, in the Valley and Ridge uh, today. So some much older rock layers. And I hope you can imagine how this uh, sort of arrangement of folds and faults was caused by a continental scale compression in that mountain building episode. So the rock layers were squeezed one on another. Uh, there's a detachment in a relatively weak shale layer here, uh, like a carpet on a hardwood floor. It bunches up and makes folds in front of it. Um, and so hopefully you get an idea of uh, the fold belt here from the ancient mountain belt, broader folds in front in the high plateau, still some folds in the low plateau, but they're much lower relief and fairly flat lying rock layers. There's the position of the Ohio River and Wellsburg in the low plateau. And here's a closer view of just that uppermost part. The rocks that are in outcrop here are Pennsylvanian and Permian in age, about 300 million years, give or take, uh, tens of millions of years. The black line shows the position of the Pittsburgh coal, which is in the upper part of the outcrop across from Wellsburg. We'll see that from across the water. And then there's some older rocks um, in outcrop there too of uh, Pennsylvanian age. Um, the W is the position of Wellsburg. There's the Ohio River. And you can see that the Pittsburgh coal goes into the subsurface going off toward Pennsylvania. Um, there are places where it crops out again in stream valleys to the um, west um, until finally it's, it's uh, eroded away um, and there are older rock layers at the surface. And you'll see that there's been mining all through this area. It's been uh, really great uh, to be able to uh, mine in from the surface here. Uh, these mines, some of them go back tens of miles um, and then use transportation of the rivers uh, to transport coal and of the railroads that uh, went along the river valleys to be able to transport the coal that was uh, uh, initially mined uh, back in from the rivers. And of course there are mines uh, deep mines that uh, come down from the surface uh, far, far back away from the rivers too. And then uh, in some places, uh, surface mines as well. So again, this is the outcrop that we'll see uh, across from Wellsburg. And you get an idea of how that fits in the cross section of uh, the very thick sedimentary rock cover in this part of the plateau. The rocks we'll see in outcrop are Pennsylvanian to Permian in age. Uh, the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian eras here are also called the Carboniferous um, and about 300 million years old, give or take. The divisions here are uh, 10 million year divisions. We'll also talk about some glacial deposits that are less than 3 million years old. And just for reference, I'm showing the age of the Marcellus Shale. I know that's important to a lot of people in the area, as well as the Utica. Uh, shale, both of those being shale gas targets, are both much older than the rocks that are at the surface. And this uh, time scale goes back over 500 million years. That's a lot of time, but it's a small fraction of Earth history, which goes back more than four and a half billion years. This is uh, a map of uh, arrangement of continents um, about 300 million years ago, about the time that the rocks we'll be seeing were deposited. I mentioned there was a continental scale collision along the Eastern margin of North America, the North American 
continent, this part of Africa and North America collided and made a mountain belt. So that was the mountain belt that was off to the east. And there were sediment basins on the flank of that. Many of them accumulated uh, coals in them. You can see how close we were to the equator at this time. Um, so there are coal basins uh, adjacent to that mountain belt on both sides. And so that's why this area is called the Carboniferous because there was so much coal deposited. I'll also point out that there were continents together at the South Pole at this time. And just like the last few million years, this is another time when there were continental scale glaciers, in this case at the South Pole. And uh, as glaciers came and went uh, through natural cycles, um, there were large uh, changes in sea level up and down too, just like there have been, and that I'll show you for the last few million years, two million years or so. So it's another glacial, interglacial world uh, in the rocks in outcrop uh, that we'll see uh, kind of a lot like the world is today in the last couple million years. This is meant to be a cross section uh, across Pennsylvania from uh, east to the right to west to the left. This time the colors represent different types of rock, not ages of rock. And you can see these 500 plus million year old rock layers here going up to ones that are 300 million years and a bit younger uh, at the top. And the rocks that we'll see in outcrop are just this part of the sedimentary column, a lot like you saw in that cross section. Uh, the black lines here are coal layers, thick coals. Um, this is a marine limestone in this medium blue. Um, there are uh, coastal plain, non-marine shales uh, shown in white here. Um, there also are some offshore shales too. And the tan colors are sandstones. Um, here's the Marcellus Shale, uh, Middle Devonian in age. And uh, there's the level of the Utica Point Pleasant too, Ordovician in age. And the ages of rocks uh, that we'll see are we're in the upper part of that section. Um, and the ones specifically in the outcrop across the river, which I'm calling the brilliant outcrop named for the town in Ohio that it sits next to are this part of the section. These are rock layers. You can see the, the key to the colors uh, representing these rock layers. Again, about 300 million years old. There's the Pittsburgh coal in black. There's some other thin coals that uh, are present in places. The Ames limestone is a marine limestone that we'll see. That's another key unit. And the Morgantown sandstone is a very prominent sandstone in that outcrop too. But the upper part of the outcrop gets into these uh, light blue layers. Those are uh, non-marine limestones. And I'll just point out that um, the typical way that we represent limestones, if you're drawing them when we're in the park together on the 24th, is with a brick pattern. And we typically use a stippled pattern uh, to represent sandstones and then dashed lines uh, to re represent fine grain rocks like shales. Uh, that aren't as resistant to erosion. And then something uh, uh, black <laughs> to represent coal. So those are the rocks that we'll see. And, and uh, another uh, type of rock here are red beds. So these are, these are um, shales. They're full of clay that actually weather red. Uh, they have uh, lots of iron in them. And you'll see a, an example of that in the rock kits when we do um, the uh, uh, rock identification as well as you'll see that in outcrop across the river. Okay, now a little section on paleoclimate. And a lot of times when people think about paleoclimate, this is the data set they talk about, a data set that goes back to the 1800s. As long as there have been confident uh, global thermometer-based temperature measurements that can use to be used to come up with an uh, annual global temperature. And in recent years, uh, as these different uh, research organizations come out with their estimate of what global temperature was in the prior year, um, they'll say this was the hottest uh, year on record or second hottest or third, or it's a trend or something. But what they're really talking about is, is this thermometer-based global data set that goes back to the 1800s, not all of geologic time. I should also mention the vertical axis here uh, the subdivisions are two tenths of a degree C. And you can see that there's been a rise in uh, 
global temperature of about a degree C since the 1970s. Before the 1970s, there were some ups and downs, um, but the, uh, it's been a much more steady rise since then. So when people are talking about uh, global warming and global temperature, often this is the data set they're talking about in terms of geologic time, a very recent data set using thermometer-based global measurements. And there's a lot of chatter in that. This is just the upward part of the trend from the 1960s. There's the 1970s coming up to uh, uh, the, the 2010s. And uh, in this, the data points, the annual data points are colored, whether there was a La Nina current in the Pacific or an El Nino current, um, which one of these is happening uh, affects global climate. And they, they alternate, they, they go from one to another, they go back and forth, not every year, but every few years they go back and forth, as you can see here. So when you look at that, you can see that there's a trend for El Nino years, there's a trend for La Nina years. These are volcanic years. A lot of times when there's a large volcanic eruption, it can cool global temperatures for a year or two. And then the black squares are uh, neutral years without El Nino or La Nina. So it looked like there was a lot of chatter in that uh, chart, but when you sort out the El Nino and La Nina years, um, it kind of makes even, even more, uh, a more, even more regular um, progression of uh, increased temperatures. So now we're gonna look back a lot farther in time. And now uh, it's way before there were people here. So we're using other things to estimate temperature. And um, uh, what's used for all of this is stable oxygen isotopes uh, are used as a proxy of temperature. And, and they work really well um, to indicate uh, uh, paleo temperature of, of the environment. Um, and uh, that's a part of the climate talk I normally give. But if I start going into that, it'll make this talk way too long. So I'm happy to talk about that on the outcrop or give a talk about climate uh, separately to uh, groups if you like. Um, the time scale here on the top varies. This is 5,000 year increments, 200,000 year, million year increments, 10 million year increments, and then 100 million year increments going back more than 500 million years ago. And the vertical axis here is an estimate uh, of degrees C, the divisions are two degrees C, again, from this oxygen isotope proxy for temperature. And the blue lines here are oxygen isotopes measured from ice in ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. And so higher temperatures uh, recently, going back about 12,000 years, and then some cooler temperatures, several degrees C cooler. This is the last glacial maximum. When glaciers came down, covered Canada came down into the US and you'll see a map of that. So between about 18 and 20,000 years ago was the maximum of the last glacial period, a uh, very cold period, um, glaciers covering uh, much of the Northern hemisphere uh, in addition to Antarctica and Greenland where we still have glaciers. And when those glaciers melted, sea level rose going into the current interglacial period, sea level rose something like 120 meters. So this is not only a temperature profile and, and an indication of how much glacial ice there was, but it's also indicating global sea level. And when we go back into the last million years, more than 20,000 years ago, you can see there's a, a pretty regular alternation of glacial periods with interglacials. Um, the current interglacial is about 12,000 years uh, long so far. This one was about that long too. These interglacials were shorter. Some of those had temperatures that were a little bit higher than the current temperature. Um, and it's a 100,000 year pulse of these with maybe a higher frequency pulse superimposed on it. And I'll talk about the natural origin of those cycles, 100,000 year cycle, and then a couple of higher frequency cycles. When you go back longer than about a million years ago, then there still were glacier interglacial periods, but they were about every 40,000 years or so, a different natural cycle. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that. When you go back farther in time, though, there were times when there were no 
glaciers in uh, Antarctica. Um, no ice there. Uh, and a much warmer time, uh, much higher sea level than today. Um, when you go back really far in time, this is 300 million years ago, about the age of the rocks in outcrop that we'll see. And you'll notice that in this interpretation, this is also a relatively cool period. And as I mentioned, that's a period when there were continental scale glaciers, just like the last few million years. And uh, there almost certainly were alternations in glacial interglacial cycles, just like there have been the last few, few million years, together with significant changes in sea level, just like there have been uh, recently. Just one other point on this, uh, when you look at the expanded version down here, you'll notice that going from the glacial to the interglacial cycles, that part of, the, of these natural cycles has tended to be relatively rapid uh, in, in the scale of thousands of years. And when people look at these really, really closely, they can find significant changes of sea level in periods as short as hundreds of years. So that part of these natural cycles has been relatively abrupt compared with going into the glacial part of the cycle, which has been more gradual and stepwise. Okay, I promised to talk about natural cycles. Um, these are cycles that are named after a Lankovic, a scientist, and there are three main periodicities, although there are variations around these, uh, these numbers. Um, these are cycles of Earth's orbit around the sun, and they're thought to have affected global climate in various ways at different times all through Earth history. And you can see records of them all through Earth history in the sediments that were deposited. So the eccentricity cycle is the 100,000 year cycle, give or take a bit. And that's the cycle of how round versus oval Earth's orbit around the sun is. So that's had a, a, an alternating uh, shape that's affected climate at times in the past and is thought to have controlled those large glacier interglacial cycles in the last million years. Before that, obliquity is thought to have controlled them for a million years or so uh, before. And obliquity is uh, the tilt of Earth's axis relative to the sun. That also has a periodicity of 41,000 years, roughly. And then precession, if you spin a top, the axis of the top will rotate like this. That's a precessional cycle, and that's on about a 21,000 year cycle. Those cycles are all happening at the same time. So this is meant to represent uh, with a time scale at the bottom here, these are 100,000 year increments. Those cycles are all happening at the same time. So they can constructively and destructively interfere with each other. This is meant to indicate uh, what those cycles uh, would have done to solar radiation hitting Earth at a certain latitude, say 65 degrees north. And here you can see um, oxygen isotopes from uh, ice in ice cores um, versus from marine fossils. So um, just as oxygen isotopes can indicate temperature changes uh, in uh, uh, ice cores, um, oxygen and calcium carbonate in marine fossils can show the same thing. And here you can see these uh, microscopic marine fossils are showing the same temperature record as the ice cores. And I should have mentioned before, that's, that's how this chart gets to go back so far because there are marine fossils with calcium carbonate shells that go back that far into earth history. And so that's what is, what is used for the temperature proxy beyond uh, old ages where we have uh, recovered and people have studied ice from uh, Antarctica and, and Greenland. So the blue part of, of this is from ice cores. The black and, and other colors here uh, indicate oxygen isotope temperature proxies from marine fossils. This is a rock outcrop in central Colorado, uh, equivalent to the marine shale I showed near the beginning of the presentation. This is half a meter for scale vertically. These are uh, the light colored bands are limestones. These are shales that are gray in color and they, they alternate. And th these rocks have been thought for more than hundred years to represent Milankovitch cycles around 40 to 100,000 years is what people think now that there were alternations in climate 
that resulted in these bands of different types of sediment that were deposited in this interior seaway 93 million years ago. And people find those kinds of alternations all through the rock record, um, including the ones that I mentioned before that could be caused by sea level changes in the rocks we'll see going from a marine limestone uh, through offshore shale and then a delta and a, a river possibly, and then some coastal plain deposits and then another marine uh, shale. So those marine floodings uh, uh, could be uh, caused by global sea level um, as, as well as shifting of deltas, but um, the global ones can represent uh, climate cycles, a lot like the ones that we're seeing in the outcrop picture here, but expressed differently because you're close to the shoreline in the rocks that are 300 million years old that we'll see. Okay, now we're gonna look in a little in more detail at the river valleys in this area. Uh, we talked about climate before. I wanted to show this map because of the, the glaciers that covered Canada and came down into the lower 48 of the US. The blue dashed lines indicate the maximum extent of glaciation. So where we will be in Wellsburg wasn't thought to be covered by glaciers, although they weren't very far away. But even so, the river valleys in this area were uh, greatly influenced by the glaciations that came and went over the last 2.6 million years. This is, um, I, I, I should show, I should point out the Ohio River is this state boundary here. And notice how that's right along the edge. It kind of skirts the edge, goes out in front of the maximum extent of glaciers. Well, rivers in this area before the glaciers came are thought to have drained to the north. But when glaciers came, it stopped that drainage from happening and forced the rivers to drain in another direction. So the area outside of the glaciers here um, had the Ohio River form in this position. And I'm gonna show this in a lot more detail. And the next slide, I'm gonna show um, the interpreted river system in this, in this area before glaciers came. I've overlaid it on this map, along with a, a map of Ohio that I'll explain too. So if we, if we look really closely here, I've overlain a map of the Taze River uh, and the new river drainage uh, as far as the Blue Ridge in North Carolina. This new river drainage goes through Virginia and West Virginia, uh, turns into the Kanawha uh, drainage. Um, that, that Taze River is uh, observed uh, to have gone across Ohio, not far from Columbus, um, across Indiana and Illinois, and then drained uh, to the south in this area. And there are tributaries here from around Cincinnati. And there were, that there was actually a drainage divide between that pre-glacial large river system and uh, Monongahela and uppermost Ohio river drainage system that also drained to the north. And they're thought to have been rivers that drained to the north in northwestern Pennsylvania too. But when the glaciers came and this shaded outline indicates the edge of glaciers, the glaciers, uh, uh, forced those rivers to drain in another direction. And in Ohio here, they completely covered up these drainages and filled them with glacial sediment. So it's very flat <laughs> in this part of Ohio now. There, there isn't a 400 foot deep river valley like there was at one time. That 400 foot valley is all filled with sediment of glacial age as it was overrun by glaciers. And that's, that's what this map shows. This is a map of thickness of uh, glacially derived sediment in Ohio. The red line is the extent of glaciers. Here's Wellsburg, just so you stay oriented. These are thick uh, deposits of glacial age material. And this is, this is that Taze River that came down from the south, um, came up into this area not far from Columbus. See how uh, thick these uh, river deposits were. And I think you can pick out uh, this this river's whole river system that was then overrun by glaciers and filled in. So the uh, land surface here is really pretty smooth now, but it's underlain by a buried valley that's as much as 400 feet deep, kind of uh, the same sort of uh, depth 
of valleys along the upper Ohio River system. So that's a little bit of background about the Taze River. Um, and um, where we are is across an interpreted drainage divide where these rivers, the upper Ohio drain to the north too. And, and so did this part of the Ohio River drain into the Taze system. The next series of maps I'm going to show, um, it, it's good to uh, uh, give you some background before we look at those. Um, Earth scientists use analogs a lot to try to understand uh, how things happen in the, in the geologic past. Because Earth systems are so complex, analogies are really useful. So here we see a satellite image of the Mississippi River. Uh, you can see it in brown. There's a scale down here. It's five miles. There's the city of Memphis. This is the Mississippi River alluvial valley. It's a lowland. And you can see, I hope, places where the Mississippi River used to run, but then the river has cut those off and abandoned them. Uh, but you can see the curved shapes of those. You can see some of these up here too. Now that your eyes clued in from the ones that are really obvious farther south, you can see a lot of these shapes of where the river was. And we're gonna look for some of those in, uh, in uh, our landscapes uh, in the, this region as well. Here's another analog example. This time it's a sand table where people are trying to understand rivers and streams, what kinds of deposits they leave behind. So here's a mini river that uh, has cut down in this stream table. As it cut down, it left behind a bench here. And you can see the nice curved edge to the bench. It's a higher bench. And then the, the river, the little mini river here has cut down and left that perched older bench behind. Those are some of the features we're gonna look for now in our region to try to understand better um, the history of the river valleys here. Okay, here's another one of these elevation maps. Um, this is a little north of uh, where we are. There's Steubenville, there's Pittsburgh, uh, Beaver, there's Butler in Pennsylvania. This is the maximum glacial advance, this dashed line. So here's the Allegheny River coming down. There's Parker, Interstate 80 crosses right about here. Um, Allegheny River coming down to Pittsburgh. Here's the Monongahela River coming up from West Virginia and Morgantown to Pittsburgh, forming the Ohio. The Ohio flows more or less north and then west and then south. It kind of go, flows north to go south. And it's thought, as I mentioned before, that this part of the Ohio River actually used to flow to the north and that this part of the Ohio River uh, has always flowed to the north, that they joined uh, somewhere up in this area, and that actually this part of the Ohio River, uh, it's a straight shot to go up the Beaver Valley here, and that actually this Monongahela River used to flow up in a river valley in this direction until thick glaciers came, stopped that uh, drainage, and formed a lake. And you'll see, you'll see some details from around Parker here. It's helpful to be oriented to where Parker's located, as well as Pittsburgh and then the upper Ohio Valley. So there's Parker, as I mentioned. This is an elevation map again. There's Interstate 80, so you get an idea where this is. This is the Allegheny River. And um, here, uh, the Allegheny River Valley has this wide area, wide part of the valley but it's much higher than the current river. The present day river is, has cut down. And this is a, a bench that's left behind, uh, cut by the ancient Allegheny River. Look at this nice loop, like those ones we saw in our analogs, some nice curved shapes that were cut by the ancient Allegheny River before it cut down. And just for reference, that's the Clarion River. And uh, this is the Red Bank. If we look at this more closely, there's the town of Parker. Um, here's this nice bend. And the reason I'm showing this, even though it's so far from Wellsburg, is because people recognize this as uh, a perched ancient riverbed uh, as long ago as the late 1800s, way before they had satellite images and the beautiful di digital elevation maps that we can use today. This was obvious to them that this was a perched river valley. And they found river sediment on it, um, as you'll see in the next slide. 
So after the river system was reorganized and cut down and sized through this old river system, um, then there are these side valleys uh, that are incising their way up into this uh, ancient uh, riverbed on, on uh, both sides of the Allegheny. These are uh, sediments that can be found uh, at the surface and near the surface um, in this uh, ancient riverbed. There are rounded cobbles. There's river rock, pebbles, cobbles, and small boulders that once rolled along the bottom of the Allegheny River and now are hundreds of feet above current river level and probably have been sitting there for more than a million years, maybe as much as 1.8 million years uh, and since uh, before the whole river system was reorganized. Most of these uh, river rounded rocks are sandstones, quartz rich sandstones that are locally derived. But some of them like this one, this is uh, a crystalline rock that was carried down by glaciers from Canada and then washed into the river system. So some of the rocks here have uh, come from pretty far away, uh, carried down by glaciers and then washed into this uh, river system that drained from the north. And this Parker Strath was so famous, it was studied by many geologists in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's so famous that uh, prominent river levels all through that Taze system, as far west as Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia, they talk about the Parker Strath as a, a prominent river terrace level. So it's a, it's a pretty famous locality. Looking farther south then, uh, there's Pittsburgh, where the Allegheny and Monongahela come together to form the Ohio. And I hope you can see some terraces here too. Here's a really good one. It's about a mile wide. It goes uh, through a swath around Pittsburgh. Um, there's some others here too. Um, some more of them along the, along the uh, Allegheny River. Um, there's one that was uh, surely formed by the Yokogany River. Um, there's some other terraces along the Monongahela as well. And then we'll see some beautiful terraces here a little bit later uh, along Chartier's Creek. So those, those occur along these river systems, including in the upper Ohio Valley. And I'm showing these examples because they're such clear examples and because they're important for a lot of people in our region. Here's a, a closer view of an elevation map around Pittsburgh. So this is that mile wide flat area that surely was once the bottom of the ancient Monongahela River before the river systems were reorganized and the river cut down and, and cut that uh, bench off and left it high and dry. And since then, uh, as you can see, both from the Allegheny and from the Monongahela, there are streams that have incised their way or eroding into that uh, flat perched uh, uh, river bottom. This is East Liberty. If you're familiar with uh, Pittsburgh Swiss Vales over here, uh, Wilkinsburg, East Liberty is very flat, goes around to Oakland. Um, and this is a nine mile run. This is Fern Hollow, which is a tributary. And we're gonna look at um, an image uh, in the next slide that comes from Fern Hollow there. And then we'll turn our attention over here to uh, Chartier's Creek, uh, which flows into the Ohio. So that's why there's uh, this really flat ground. And uh, this was an area where there was a whole lot of development early on because it was so flat compared with uh, the normal terrain around here, which is so hilly. So let's look at Fern Hollow. Here's the top of that terrace at Fern Hollow. You can see that in, in both of these images, flat topped terrace up here. Um, and there are trees that are over 200 years old. Um, uh, that give us some confidence that the sediment uh, at their roots probably has been in place uh, for a very long time. Uh, when you're dealing with sediment like this, and this is loose sand on this ancient river terrace, loose sand with pebbles, cobbles, and boulders mixed in with it. When you're dealing with loose sediment like that, especially in an urban area, you have to wonder uh, whether it was moved around by people and maybe that sediment was brought here from somewhere else by people. But uh, there's a tree just like this one that fell down, was cut uh, to make way for a, a walking path. I counted more than 200 rings in it. So I'm confident that these trees are more than 200 years old and nestled in their roots 
are these beautifully rounded cobbles and small boulders. There's a mason's hammer or a rock hammer for scale. They're in this case made of sandstone. They were carried by the ancient Monongahela River from the south, not the area that was glaciated to the north. Um, so there aren't uh, metamorphic and igneous rock cobbles here, just sandstone cobbles. But clearly this was once the bottom of a river. There's a river rock uh, deposited here on this terrace, almost 200 uh, feet above the current Monongahela River. Let's look at some other clear river terraces in the lower part of Chartier's Creek. There's McKee's Rocks. This is the Ohio River uh, downstream from Pittsburgh. And in the Crafton Ingram area, you can see in, in green here, there's a lower terrace level, beautiful curves cut by the ancient Chartier's Creek and the ancestral Chartier's Creek cut curves here too at a different level. It's yellow in color, it's a higher elevation. If we uh, look at that a little more closely, uh, you can see that the current Chartier's Creek is uh, deeper, it's incised into these abandoned perched ancient terraces. We'll take a couple of representative elevations, one from each of those two terraces, the yellow colored terrace and the green elevations here. And then we're gonna look at those on an elevation chart. But to show you the elevation chart first, I need to introduce a concept. And I'll use this idealized diagram for that. This is meant to be a diagram of the bottom of a river or a stream. This is elevation vertically and then horizontal distance uh, going from an upland area, coming into a base level, you could be coming into a lake, into the ocean. Maybe it's a stream coming into a, a major river that's been at the same elevation for a long time. And uh, streams and rivers tend to try to come to a, a smooth equilibrium uh, elevation profile like this. If base level were to drop, if sea level dropped or lake level dropped, or the level of a major river dropped that the stream flowed into, then this, this stream or river is gonna to try to establish a new equilibrium profile. There will be erosion that works its way upstream until it establishes a new equilibrium profile. So that's the concept of an ideal stream profile. And here's some actual measurements from Chartier's Creek. This is from a master's thesis that was done at WVU just a couple of years ago. And here you can see in the upland area of Chartier's Creek, this is south of uh, Washington, PA, um, so pretty far upstream. There's this really nice smooth uh, curve profile. You can imagine that being part of an equilibrium profile. And then the, it's steeper. The stream valley is steeper coming down to the current uh, level of the Ohio River. Those are those terraces, those beautiful terraces we saw in the lower part of Chartier's uh, Creek Valley. And I think you can easily imagine that at one time, Chartier's Creek would have had a profile something like this, closer to an equilibrium profile. And that uh, the Ohio River having cut down has forced Chartier's Creek to cut down too. And that erosion has worked its way up to about the I-70 exit 15 near Washington. Uh, it's clearly the boundary between uh, more erosion and maybe an older landscape and uh, uh, less rapid erosion. And that's also called a nick point. Sometimes that nick point is at a waterfall. Um, waterfalls have other special conditions. So they have to have a resistant layer above, a less resistant to erosion layer below to create a great waterfall like at Niagara Falls or other waterfalls. So you need a change in base level and a nick point to make a waterfall, but you need other special conditions to make a waterfall too. Sometimes it's just a change in elevation profile or a cascade. So uh, you can imagine then there being other terraces along this stream profile uh, that would have fit other uh, profiles than the one we have today, but that those terraces are perched high and dry. And those exist along Chartier's Valley and they also exist along the Ohio River Valley. And, and we'll look at some of those um, terraces in a bit. These are terrace levels that were uh, identified in a study of the Allegheny River system uh, 20 or so years ago. You can see that they've identified several different levels of different ages with the upper higher terraces being older than the lower terraces. 
just like we saw with that stream table analog. There are a couple other features of uh, rivers uh, around uh, the edges of glaciers that I want to point out using this as another analog. So this is an ancient analog this time. This is the Wisconsin River. Uh, Madison is off to the east of this map. Um, and this is the Mississippi River Valley over here. So it's a, a terrain uh, image. You can see this uh, you know, lots of upland areas here and then the flat uh, river valley. So this Mississippi River, this part of the Mississippi River, and then the Wisconsin River are thought to have been a single system that drained to the south and then drained to the east before glaciers came and stopped this river from draining to the east and forced it to turn around and drain instead of east to drain to the west as it does today. Um, and then there's this part of the Mississippi River that uh, is thought to have uh, uh, formed uh, when this uh, uh, river system was backed up into a lake and the lake spilled over this highland area and then uh, caused uh, erosion that, that caused the whole Mississippi River drainage to drain to the south through here instead of draining to the east as it did before glaciers came. So what is the evidence for all of this? Well, some of the evidence is elevation of these terraces that are in these white boxes. The, the bedrock level underneath uh, perched river sediment, that bedrock level drops going to the east. So that's evidence that the river system that cut that terrace or those terraces was decreasing in elevation, was dropping to the east and the river was flowing that way when those terraces were formed and now the river's flowing the other direction. Another form of evidence is that uh, tributaries tend to point downstream, kind of like the veins in the back of a leaf. They tend to point downstream. And so you can see with the blue areas here, um, uh, there's an observation that the tributaries uh, were formed when this Wisconsin River was draining to the east. Another form of evidence is this curve in the edge of the uplands that clearly the uh, Mississippi River was flowing around that, not just down in this direction when that curved edge of the uplands was formed. And then the other evidence here is when you look at the Mississippi River Valley, it's wider here. This is clearly uh, a valley where erosion has been happening longer. The valley has had more time to widen, uh, but this is a relatively narrow valley. The younger, the interpreted younger valley here that cut through this um, former highland um, and a drainage divide that cut through that divide between watersheds is relatively young and relatively narrow valley. So those concepts are ones that will apply to the upper Ohio Valley. The, the direction of tributaries coming into the system and then the width of the valley, uh, older valley being wider, younger valley being narrower. Okay, uh, we're back to this map. I'm going to remind you about uh, uh, that this was uh, thought to have drained to the north. Uh, glaciers didn't allow that. The whole system had to reorient and uh, drain to the south in front of uh, the glaciers. And um, here now is uh, Wellsburg. There's the upper, upper Ohio River Valley. And the orientation of major tributaries coming in here is, is part of the evidence uh, uh, that the uh, upper Ohio, Ohio Valley actually used to drain to the north. I'll just mention it's fairly straight also and uh, farther south in the Ohio River Valley, um, there are a lot more uh, bends in it. So it's kind of different that way too. But hopefully you can imagine this part of the Ohio River, along with the Monongahela River, having originally drained right up the Beaver Valley here and the upper Ohio having drained into that. A little bit closer view, again, uh, that this river system is thought to have drained to the north before the glaciers came. And here's uh, this interpreted pre-glacial drainage pattern with these segments of what's now the Allegheny River having drained to the north before glaciers came, along with the Monongahela River here. There's the Okagany, there's the lower Allegheny coming together at Pittsburgh, and this part of the Monongahela, now Ohio River, 
having drained up through the Beaver Valley to the north and having been met by this part of the ancestral upper Ohio River. And again, the star indicates Wellsburg. And that that was uh, changed when glaciers came, stopped that northern drainage, and forced the rivers to drain to the south. Now we're going to look at, at that aspect of this in a bit more detail. So when the glaciers came and stopped the northern drainage, they're thought to have actually created a large lake in these river valleys uh, with a spill here at New Martinsville at an elevation of about 1,100 feet. Um, so 1,100 feet is, is pretty far up these river valleys. It would be uh, close to the top of Mount Washington in Pittsburgh. Um, you can see there's Morgantown. Um, this is the Okegany River, flooded back up into that. Uh, and um, geologists have found um, uh, lake sediments uh, that are soft, glacially aged lake sediments in these, in these uh, stream valleys in uh, enough different locations to give confidence that this actually happened. And because there's more than one glaciation, glaciers came down and, and moved back, it may actually be a more complex history than just one lake. But there's uh, is clear evidence that there was at least one lake that uh, was uh, as high as 1,100 feet at its top. Last year, for the first time, uh, there was a publication in a field trip guidebook of an age date for this lake deposit. Before last year, when people wrote about the interpreted age of this, they would talk about ages maybe as much as 900,000 years ago. But this age date is 1.8 million years, definitely within this glacial interglacial uh, uh, period that we're in uh, in the last two and a half million years, uh, but pretty old, 1.8 million years ago. So that's probably a key time for reorganization of this river system. And you, I hope you can imagine that as the lake filled up here and then reached a spill level here around New Martinsville, where it started to spill into a, a river valley to the south, that that would cause erosion, that would work its way back into the river system eventually and uh, cause a deepening of the whole river system. And I think that'll be a little more clear in some diagrams that you'll see in a few minutes. So glacial Lake Monongahela now dated at 1.8 million years ago, very extensive, and there may have been other glacially created lakes too. This is uh, oxygen isotope uh, expression of uh, climate. This, here you can see it's used as a proxy for degree C. This is from marine microfossils, the shells of marine microfossils. This time, the time scale doesn't vary. There's a million years, two million years, three million years ago. So here are those 100,000 year glacial, interglacial cycles that we talked about before. Those are the 41,000 year glacial interglacial cycles going back to 2.6 million years ago. And here's that 1.8 million year age of Lake Monongahela. So there have been at least 30 glacial interglacial uh, alternations since then. So probably the history of deposits within and on the sides of these valleys are pretty complicated. Uh, and again, there may have been more than one glacially formed lake uh, during this period. Here's another map. Um, and uh, there's Pittsburgh. There's the Allegheny River coming down, Monongahela River forming the Ohio. This is the original drainage. Um, there's the extent of glaciers. Um, and uh, uh, you can see. Uh, um, that this is the interpreted drainage divide between these systems, this one uh, going into the Taze Valley. Now you can see it in a lot more detail. Remember I mentioned how sinuous this is and even more so beyond here compared with how straight the upper Ohio Valley is here. It's another difference in between those, but a, a drainage divide somewhere around New Martinsville. And of course the current Ohio River goes right through this. So here's a, a stream profile then um, going from Pittsburgh along the Ohio River, past uh, Wellsburg and, and down the Ohio. There's Wellsburg, there's Pittsburgh. And this is um, elevation, it's 50 foot increments of the bottom of the river. So the channel of the Ohio River. And this is the top of bedrock. So there's sediment in between those two. 
So there's a profile of, of the bottom of the river and, and a bedrock below the river going way down. This is hundreds of miles below Pittsburgh, 300 miles below Pittsburgh, there's to Huntington. And uh, on the bottom here is how wide the Ohio Valley is. You can see here it's relatively narrow in the upper Ohio and the lower Ohio is wider on average, generally wider. So remember I talked about that uh, narrower uh, um, valley uh, of the Mississippi where it was a, a younger valley, um, not as it hasn't had as much time to widen itself through erosion. This is about where that drainage divide is interpreted to be. So it's especially narrow through there, but generally narrower through the upper Ohio Valley here than uh, farther uh, south. Here's a close up of um, the vertical profile along the river channel and then the top of bedrock. So there's tens of feet, about 40 feet of sediment in this uh, map, at least between the Ohio River channel and bedrock uh, in the vicinity of Wellsburg. Here's a look at that in Wheeling where someone's published a cross section. So this is a section then that goes across the Ohio River and shows the bedrock below here and then the soft sediment on top of that. And colored in uh, tan here with a stippled pattern, those are sands and gravels of glacial age. So glaciers didn't come this far south, but this is sand and gravel that washed into the river valley and was deposited at uh, the a time of glaciation, uh, probably the last glaciation uh, 18 to 20,000 years ago or so. And then some younger sediments uh, deposited on top of that uh, without the color applied to them. Um, so some glacial age sediment in the Ohio Valley. Here you can see it in cross section and here you can see it in long section. Um, this is a chart that we're gonna um, look at in some detail for a series of slides. Um, so this is from a publication from 1988. And uh, like the last slide that we saw, um, this is going from Pittsburgh down the Ohio River, more than 300 miles. There's Parkersburg, New Martinsville, that interpreted drainage divide I mentioned. There's Wellsburg. Also, this is the Monongahela River going up past Morgantown. So uh, these uh, horizontal lines are the current pools uh, and the dams uh, holding those pools. So that's present day river level. You saw a, a chart that showed uh, the bottom of the river and the sediment below the river uh, just a few minutes ago in this area. So those are current pools. And each of these dashed lines then is where uh, the authors have identified a river terrace, an ancient perched river terrace. And the, the line is there, uh, they used topographic maps. Uh, they didn't have digital elevation maps like we have now. Someone could do a really good job of this with digital maps today but they did what, what they could with what they had uh, for those river terraces. So um, this is about the level of that terrace I showed you uh, that goes around in East Liberty um, and uh, um, Fern Hollow, I showed you some deposits. I think that's this terrace. So they've taken a lot of this information and put it together to identify river terraces uh, perched above, way above the current river level. This is elevation in meters. That's 100 meters elevation uh, for scale. So in black font, I'm showing their identification of uh, river terraces. And they've also looked at the character of sediment, uh, not only that they looked at, but that others published about too. And this is where people have found lake sediments. These lake sediments are thought to be the same age. And it's actually thought that this is about the same age as that. Remember, this is that uh, Lake uh, Monongahela sediment I talked about that's now been dated to 1.8 million years, more or less. This one, uh, I think there was an age date estimated or published for this about 2 million years. So those are about the same age, uh, more or less. And there can be more work done to help define those. But those are features that occur within these and on the sides of these valleys, including the upper Ohio River, including around Wellsburg, these perched river terraces 
that may have sand and, and river rock, uh, rounded river rock, like you saw in pictures before, may have those kinds of deposits hundreds of feet above the current Ohio River level. So working through a time series now, um, these terraces are relatively low relief, and those are both pointing uh, toward the Beaver Valley. Um, so this is that early drainage that is interpreted to have drained to the north. And then there was thought to be a drainage divide, an upland area separating this river and stream system from a river system that drained uh, to the south into the Taze River system before glaciers came. And then when glaciers came, there were lake deposits uh, left behind in these high elevations here up to 1100 feet, as I mentioned uh, for Lake Monongahela 1.8 million years ago. This is also lake, but there aren't lake sediments as high as this. It's a completely separate lake that was also formed by glaciers coming down into Ohio and plugging up that Taze River system and backing up uh, these lakes and, and uh, having fine grain silts and clays deposited in those, but at a much lower elevation separated by this drainage divide. Now here's another interpreted terrace that uh, these authors think uh, was still draining to the north at this time. And maybe there was another uh, lake that backed up, but sometime after this, this drainage divide was breached. Maybe erosion here breached that drainage divide and started to capture this river system and cause this whole river system to drain to the south now instead of draining to the north. So that's this series of terraces then draining to the south instead of draining to the north. And you can see the next series of, of drainages or, or of terraces indicate erosion down deeper, cutting farther up into the system. There's the next interpreted one. And then finally, some much uh, younger uh, terraces from uh, perhaps that last glaciation uh, 18 to 20,000 years ago, before we come down to the current river level, uh, which is uh, filled with uh, um, uh, younger glacial deposits. So series of terraces here, and, and these are really important in the Ohio River Valley. For example, Steubenville is on a whole series of river terraces. If you look at an elevation map for Steubenville, you'll see that pretty clearly. So those are, those are important. And Wellsburg is sitting on a terrace also. People like building on those flat terraces well above the current floodplain. And just to give you an idea of scale here, it's 200 feet for scale. You can see that some of these terraces are tens of feet above current river level, and some of them are 50, 70 feet, or maybe hundreds of feet above the present river level. Okay, so that's just a summary then, a reminder. I hope uh, this map means a lot more to you now in terms of the Upper Ohio having originally drained to the north. Um, now it drains to the south because the glaciers came and forced the whole drainage to drain to the south. When it integrated with the rest of the Ohio River drainage, um, it uh, caused a lot of incision to work its way up into these river systems and left those uh, nice river terraces perched high and dry uh, as the incision happened. I'll talk just briefly about earth resources. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, soil. We'll talk about groundwater a bit, I think, when we're on the outcrop there. Um, we talked about gravel and clay uh, from uh, uh, glacial deposits. I'll talk a little bit about coal, oil, and natural gas here, too. We could talk more about these um, on the 24th. But I wanted to show this big picture map of soil. Remember I mentioned those marine and non-marine limestones that are in the rocks at the surface in our area here. And those are enough uh, to help cause uh, uh, pretty good soils in a lot of areas. You know, soils are really local. So maybe uh, the soil where you are wasn't formed with those uh, marine or non-marine limestones, but a lot of the soils have those as a, a part of them. And they're pretty good soils for agriculture compared with uh, the soils shown in yellow here that don't have as much of that where uh, fertilizers and lime are more likely to be needed. 
I wanted to show a map of coal mines. And here in the panhandle, I had to use three different states to get these maps. So here's from Ohio here, coal mine maps from West Virginia. And in Pennsylvania, what I was able to find was um, maps of where there are maps of coal mines, not a map of actual mines. But there's Wellsburg in each of these maps. And there are plenty of uh, subsurface coal mines as well as uh, surface coal mines in this area, largely in, in this area mining the Pittsburgh coal, uh, which we talked about earlier in this talk and which we'll see in the outcrop. So lots of extensive coal mines here and uh, including as sources of coal to generate electricity in the big power plant uh, uh, at Brilliant just across the river in Ohio. And I've taken a public source here to uh, list at least some of the recent sources for coal that's used to generate electricity for the region in that uh, power plant at Brilliant. And I think a lot of you will know more about the power plant than I do. Uh, from what I've read though, quite a bit of money has been spent on uh, uh, cleaning emissions for this power plant, quite a, a lot of money. Um, and this is something that we can talk about uh, again on the 24th, but I think some of you may know more about the history of this and uh, the outlook for this than I do. Another important energy resource here is shale gas, both at the Marcellus level and the Utica level. Um, and I wanted to show this, Pat, even though it's in Westmoreland County in Pennsylvania, because it's got such a nice map that goes with it. So here's a multi-acre pad uh, for horizontal wells. Here they're in fracturing operation. You, you can tell that from all the trucks there. Pump trucks typically will have 10,000 horsepower of pump trucks. There are trucks loaded with uh, uh, sand. There are trucks with uh, water uh, to do the hydraulic fracturing. There's a, a, a boom, a crane that's used in this part of the operation. And in the map view here, that's this pad. It's several acres in size, but at this scale, a mile here for scale, it's this little red dot. And the blue lines are the well paths being drilled away from that. Um, and now, this is, uh, this is from 2011. Now, at least in some places, horizontals in these plays are drilled as long as 10,000 feet laterally, so almost two miles laterally, maybe seven, 8,000 feet deep for the Marcellus, even deeper, 10,000 or so maybe for the Utica. And uh, they could be a mile or almost two miles laterally so that the area drained by each of these multi-well pads can be a number of square miles in size uh, drained by a, a single pad that's uh, several acres in size. Um, another example of this from Washington County, a little bit closer to where we'll be. I wanted to show this because this is the location of the so-called discovery well for the Marcellus play, uh, the Rens unit number one. It's a vertical well that was drilled and then fractured, it was drilled for a deeper objective, dry in that deeper objective, but uh, fractured at the Marcellus level. It, it produced well enough to give confidence that it could work as a horizontal well play. Um, this is where the satellite image is uh, in this part of Washington County. There's the vertical discovery well. And I wanted to show this because it shows the uh, pattern of horizontal wells drilled from pads in this part of Washington County for the Marcellus. You might notice if you look closely, there are a couple of wells drilled in a contrary direction, but obviously people found that that wasn't uh, something that worked well for producing here. Um, the wells tend to be drilled in this northwest southeast direction uh, because when uh, hydraulic fracturing creates um, uh, fractures, it's wanted for the fractures to make a complex pattern that goes across the well bores, uh, not a single fracture that goes along the well bore. So there's more uh, communication between the rock and the well bore. Um, and uh, that fracture orientation is controlled by the current state of stress in the Earth's crust here, um, and which is a, a kind of a large regional orientation. So that's the orientation that's used for these horizontals because of that state of stress and, and the preferred orientation of inducing fractures right around the well bores. Um, and you know, that would be the orientation that's used in the West Virginia Panhandle and into Ohio as well, I'm sure. One of the important things in uh, producing shale gas 
is uh, dealing with the flowback water. This is a chart of salinity versus daily volume of water. Uh, here's 10 days, 20 days, 50 days since uh, flowback after fracturing. So here, here comes water out along with the natural gas that's coming out of the reservoir under pressure. And initially, uh, that, that water, uh, there's a lot of it at first. The volume of it tapers off. Uh, but also, initially, it's pretty fresh water. And then it's got the salinity of seawater. And then soon it's got a salinity that's many times more saline and and than uh, seawater. So it's a brine. And this is meant to illustrate a series of this from relatively fresh water early on to uh, brine, uh, maybe low in volume, but uh, a more saline brine later on. So this is the flowback water. Uh, and uh, this is one of the things that's important about uh, production in, this, in these plays is that the flowback water that comes back to the surface is handled carefully so it doesn't end up in the groundwater. So that's one of the considerations for these and something that companies are pretty careful about and that regulator, regulators watch pretty carefully too. Okay, the last part of this, we'll talk about the event. Um, we're gonna meet from one to 2.30 on the 24th, it's a Sunday. Our main objective is for everyone to be able to identify in hand samples, the main types of rocks that are at the surface in our area. Secondary objective is to look at the outcrop across the river and talk about why it looks the way it does, talk about the rock layers that are there. I'll give a flip chart orientation to start with, with a few of the maps that are in this slide set, but it'll be nothing like this, much briefer than this. And then we'll do a rock identification exercise using those hand samples. I showed you a picture of those. And then we'll look at the outcrop across the way, talk about the rock layers that are there, uh, what they look like in the outcrop using binoculars. Hopefully you'll sketch them on a pad with a pencil so you can uh, look carefully. Uh, it'll, it'll cause you to look carefully at the rock layers. They're not all just flat in that outcrop. And, and then we'll talk about why they look the way they do. So it's recommended to bring a folding chair, paper, pencil, eraser, and, and uh, paper and something to put it on so you can draw. It's good to have a face mask because I only have 10 rock sets uh, for the rock identification. If more people show up, uh, you may be in a small group uh, doing that part of the exercise. So it's probably a good idea to have a face mask just for that part. It'd be great to have binoculars so you can look carefully at the outcrop. It'd be helpful to have the kind of hand lens a coin collector uses to look at the uh, rocks. Um, some of the, a couple of the rocks do have marine fossils in them. You'll be able to see those a little better with a hand lens. I'll have one that I can lend. And uh, limestones, uh, one of the identifications of those is that they fizz in dilute acid. I'll have some dilute acid if you want to do that test on the rocks, you'll be able to. You're welcome to bring rocks for me to try to identify. It's especially helpful if you tell me where it came from, uh, rocks and fossils, that could be fun. So we're gonna meet in Wellsburg in 17th Street Park up near the edge of the river beyond uh, the end of 18th Street. And uh, We'll spend more than an hour sitting outside. That's why a folding chair will be helpful. Look at the weather forecast, sunscreen. A hat might be helpful if it's gonna be sunny. It'd be good to have fluids. Um, there should be a porta potty unlocked to use. If you're coming from somewhere else, be sure to be courteous in parking. The neighborhood is used to people coming and parking there, I'm sure because of the ball field, but please be sure not to block anyone's driveway and be courteous in parking. So there's where we're gonna meet uh, in the grassy place where we can see across the river um, and uh, do that outdoor geology activity. And this is the part of the section we're gonna look at from above the Pittsburgh cold to below the Ames limestone, including the Morgantown sandstone here. These are the rocks that are in hand sample that you'll identify. So those come from these rock layers. Um, not necessarily you know, right at Wellsburg, but from this region, uh, they come from the rock layers that, that show up uh, at the surface across the river. There's the Ames limestone that I mentioned before. It's, a, it's thin, but it's resistant to erosion. 
and there's some shales that are not resistant to erosion. This cliff is the Morgantown sandstone, and that black band up there is the Pittsburgh coal. So this is just a little part of the outcrop that we'll be able to observe carefully together, and hopefully I'll give you a greater appreciation for it uh, so that when you see it in the future from Wellsburg, you'll have a greater understanding of why it looks the way it does. This is one of the hand samples that may be in one of the rock kits. That's a piece of the Ames limestone that has some marine fossils in it. I'll, uh, I'll provide a sketch of what kind of fossils these were that grew in seawater 300 or so million years ago. So let's uh, explore some geology together. And I hope this has been helpful in giving you a greater appreciation for the area where you live. And um, I look forward to seeing you on the 24th.